I don't like something cold and it burns her tongue. Uh huh. Hi, my name is Jamie. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're doing another Dollar Tree book review for the Creepers series that I found at my local Dollar Tree. So when I picked these up, I immediately knew that they were some kind of goosebumps, knockoff, something or other. And I didn't expect much from them. And then I quickly realized that this is meant for like a way younger audience than I realized. And I was kind of upset at myself. I was like, oh no, I just bought like all four of these books off of the shelves. Like, you know, it's kind of rude. Kids books should go to kids. Like kids should have the opportunity to go, you know, buy these books. And then I actually read them and I'm kind of glad that they're off the shelves because kids shouldn't be reading these books. <laughs> I want to make it very clear that I am not judging or critiquing these books based on my enjoyment of them as an adult. I know that these books are not going to entertain me the way that an adult thriller would. I'm not judging these books because they're cliche or childish, immature, or that, um, you know, they're predictable or anything like that. I'm saying that these books are just straight up bad. Just because something is made for kids doesn't mean that it should be bad or that being bad is excusable because it's like, oh, kids are dumber. Kids need something that's easily digestible and you know something age appropriate but that does not equate bad on like a structural level about halfway through one of these books I was like this is so bad it's almost as if it was written by AI and that's like a topical relevant argument that's going on right now with chat GTP GPT G C G whatever it's called AI taking art and um, authors and fan fiction and making it into its own thing I don't know I, there's a whole debate going on right now and I thought could this book be AI generated like it honestly feels that way so I went on a little deep dive and it's so weird trying to find information because obviously the writer is using a pen name it's um, Edgar J. Hyde and when you go to like the author's bio or the Creepers website it's got this whole thing about like J. Edgar Hyde nobody knows who he is like it's a, a pseudonym pen name mystery thing like Lemmy Snicket or Synonymous Bosch or anything like that. Creepers is also the name of another series from like the 80s so I thought for a while that this was just a reprint of creepers from the 80s and that this was just like continuously reprinted and whatnot um, and that this was like an old man just making children's books and whatnot and then I found out that this is not like these were published in the early 2000s 2010s um, but they just have the same name as a series from the 80s and I don't know it's weird <laughs> I don't know like my investigation skills are not good I still think they're AI generated just like badly <laughs> just badly written all around um and just so you're aware each book was a dollar 25 each of these books were a dollar 25 so yes well they have freeze dried mangoes I I'm gonna kind of go in order and just talk about each book briefly. The first one I read was Pen Pals and this is when I realized that this book is like kind of bad and not just it's too young for me as an adult to read, it's just kind of bad. So the story of Pen Pals features four young girls all aged 13. Two of them, Natasha and Olivia, are lifelong friends and they've just recently made friends with Marcy and Ellis. While Natasha and Olivia are passing notes in class, Olivia's like, that's so weird you keep saying weird things in your notes and Natasha's like, I'm not saying weird that I'm like saying normal things in my notes and then Olivia will show her the note and it's got like a weird message under Natasha's message and it's not in her handwriting or anything. You find out that it's a ghost trying to communicate with the two of them, and it turns out that Olivia is the descendant of the girl that killed the girl who is the ghost, and Ellis is this descendant of the ghost girl's family. So she's the descendant of the murder victim, and Olivia is the descendant of the murderer. Ellis is now trying to take revenge on um, Olivia for killing her descendant, even though she didn't really do it. It's kind of weird. <laughs> the story literally doesn't matter. Like, the story's fine, it's good, it's whatever. I, it doesn't matter. What I'm going to complain about is, like, the actual structure of this book. There is a huge amount of head hopping, 
And it's not each chapter is a different perspective. It is within the same chapter. They are going from Ellis and her thoughts and her feelings and her, not even her narration, because it's like a third person narration. They go from Ellis to Marcy, to Natasha, to Olivia, all in the same chapter. This was like the first book where I could notice the head hopping because it was that egregious of like switching from one character to the next without like a chapter break or without actually intentionally switching perspectives. It's just a lot of head hopping. <laughs> There's also a lot of extra information that's given for like no reason. So in one scene, while it's head hopping, it's talking about like Ellis doing something or other, having evil secret thoughts. And then Marcy's talking about how she's kind of jealous of Ellis or something like that. And she talks about how she wants to dye her hair or something that doesn't come back into the story at all. And with such a short story, all of the information that is given should be important to the story. You can't have all this like superfluous information for no reason. It's gotta all have a point in the story for such a short book or else you're just wasting words. There were characters who just kind of appeared on the page without any introduction whatsoever. At the very end there's this weird attention brought to the fact that Marcy's father is the one that kind of rescues Olivia but he has not been introduced at all. We had other parental figures. We had Natasha's mom, we had Marcy's mother, I believe even Ellis's parents were introduced at that point but Marcy's father was not introduced at all and yet there's this weird attention of like it was Marcy's father who pulled Olivia out of the water it was Marcy's father that held her while she cried it's like we had other parental figures that could have filled that role because they were already introduced like why did you bring so much attention to the fact that it was her father who did that another thing is like Natasha is the first character that's introduced and she has a big importance put on her um, but she's not the main character. Olivia and even Ellis are the main character. Marcy could fuck off. Like, she had no point in the story. I mean, she had just enough where I don't think you could actually remove her from the story, but she was, like, not important whatsoever. And th it was just so weird that Natasha was the first character introduced, but she was, like, not the main character. She was the sidekick at most. <laughs> it was so weird. The last final thing I'll talk about that I thought was super weird and kind of gross about this book is that there was this weird fat phobia. Like, it's only mentioned a little bit. Like, in one of the very early chapters, they're talking about, like, mixing and matching each other's like features to make the perfect girl to rival like Ellis being so beautiful and perfect and whatnot and they talk about like Natasha's tiny waist and like uh, Marcy's nose or whatever and then almost immediately after Natasha gets home and her little brother is calling her fat and she's calling him fat but he's like little he's like only three years old so he's like you're fat and she's like well your tummy's big too and it's like that's so weird to have a scene like that at all, especially for a kid's book. It doesn't come back. It doesn't have any importance in the story. It's not part of the ghost story. It's not like Ellis uses you know, Natasha's insecurity about being fat or whatnot in the story at all. Like, it does not matter, so like, why is it in the book in the first place? Next we had Ghost Writer. The story about this one is three siblings aged 13 through 15 all move to a new house across town and obviously it's a haunted house and it it gets its name Ghost Rider because the, the oldest, the 15 year old boy Charlie, who's like the main character, uh, likes to write stories for his school paper and he's currently working on a story and every time he wakes up he sees like a new chapter, a new paragraph added that he doesn't remember writing and it's like something that's mysterious and happening right now or whatever it's it's weird right obviously it's a ghost <laughs> the three siblings start to investigate and they find out that it was a teacher who was killed by the principal because the principal has this like weird demonic cult thing that he's doing and the teacher walked in on him doing his cult rituals and so the principal killed him also a lot of head hopping also a lot of like scene changes um, is very fast going from like one person to the next no transition given. But the thing that really stuck out to me for this book is that there was so much contradictory information. Very early on in the story, 
the siblings are having an argument. Um, the youngest brother, Neil, has, like, lost a bet, and their sister, Kate, is like, stop betting. You're just going to lose. And Neil's like, yeah, Charlie, we should stop doing these weird bets because I always lose and you always win. But then every other scene where they're ta playing cards, playing Monopoly, playing any kind of game, they're like, Neil always wins. It's like, you just had a scene where they talked about how Neil always loses, and almost immediately after, you're t setting up scenes and t talking about how Neil is always winning, like he's super like lucky at winning these games. Like that's just super contradictory, and it's such a short story. You should be able to see that when you read through it again. You should be able to, you know, when you're editing and and revising your story, you should see, oh, that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really connect that needs to be fixed. Another moment like that is they all come down for breakfast and their dad's like, where's Kate? And Charlie, I believe, is like, oh, she's still up in her room getting ready. And, you know, girls, haha, <laughs> they take so long to get ready or whatever. And immediately after, Kate enters the room, like not even a minute later. It's not like a time skip or anything. Like she literally enters the room, the kitchen, right after he says that, and her dad makes a point of saying like, oh, you finally decided to join us. Like that's super contradictory to what they were just, like what just happened. The actual action and what the dialogue is saying doesn't work together. And like if you were revising your story, you would see that and go, yeah, I need to change that. There was information left out for the mystery, kind of like in my review for the guest list where I talked about how people would skirt around saying the actual thing so that the mystery was still intact and you, you didn't get a chance to like actually try and figure it out. You didn't actually get to piece together the clues. Same thing but like to the umpteenth degree. For example, Charlie keeps hearing this voice in his dreams. Oh, I forgot to mention, he keeps having dreams where he is the murder victim, which is actually a really interesting idea. So he's the murder victim and he can see the murder happening and he keeps hearing this voice and he keeps thinking that the voice is familiar. He keeps telling us, I've heard that voice before, I just don't know where. And then there's a scene where the principal is talking and Charlie's like, oh, that's where I've heard that voice. But we have not met the principal as a character on page or even mentioned him before this very moment. We haven't even met the character that the voice belongs to for us to even understand where Charlie might have heard that voice. I actually, for the longest time, they had met like a creepy store clerk when he kept saying I heard that voice. I thought it was that man because that was literally the only other character we had met that wasn't you know their family so when he kept saying oh i've heard that voice before i was like oh that one man that they met at the store that makes sense but no we then have a scene where he talks to the principal or the principal is talking and that's when charlie figures it out and we have to figure it out along with him because we were given another option uh at the very end when they are like actually fighting the demonic principal and whatnot neil is knocked out and like kind of left to his own devices as the scene switches to charlie's perspective and then all of a sudden neil runs out with this like basically deus ex machina <laughs> where he's like found a contract and he's like I'm I, I've got you I know how to stop you I'm gonna stop you according to the rules of this contract and I had to go back to see if I'd missed something in Neil's scene where he gets knocked out because it does say that he starts to look around but he doesn't it doesn't say that he's found anything so after the principal has been defeated and the demonic entity is gone that's when Neil and Charlie tell Kate that Neil had found a contract just in this principal's desk I guess but in the contract it's like here are the rules I can't do anything that break these rules and I can only be defeated with this thing that's left in the box with the contract here's the thing and it's like it's like okay well <laughs> that's unrealistic but it, I think it's meant to be funny so that gets a pass but the the fact that we didn't get to see Neil find the contract and then use it not even like a hint that he found the contract he all of a sudden just runs onto the page and is like I have this contract I'm gonna stop you and then we learn what the contract is that's just it's stupid it's stupid it's not how a book should be structured or laid out we should like kids should be able to use their deductive reasoning skills in order to learn the mystery.
Like, that's what a mystery is supposed to do. Okay, next we have the Golden Goblet, which I think is, I want to say the funniest one, in my opinion. The main character is a girl named Shona. She is Scottish. Her grandmother is a Scottish witch, and there's something called, like, the secret memory, which was not really explained very well. <laughs> really not explained at all what the secret memory is, just that it's important. And the Golden Goblet is this, like, ancient goblet in which the grandmother has written down the secret memory on a piece of parchment paper, and that's why the Golden Goblet is important. The evil guy is actually Shona's father's new boss who owns like a press journalist thing. He, he owns all of the press, right? But he's also a Scottish man from like the rival clan, <laughs> and he's super evil, and he gets his hands on the Golden Goblet and finds the parchment with the secret memory, and he's like, I'm gonna read it to get all of the power in the world, and the way Shona like gets him to not read it is by distracting him until the memory fades away like the memory was written in like magic ink that faded away after a while and it just so happens to like fade at five she's actually like distracting him with like certain magical mishaps so like they're at an airport the planes get all snowed in and so like an important guest that they were waiting on can't come and then it gets to like the final two minutes and he's about to read it and there's like no reason he shouldn't read it and he starts like monologuing it's so weird he start he like is offended by somebody's comments and he starts monologuing and and basically runs out the time for no reason he's just upset that somebody said something about him and he's like i'm gonna be the most powerful man in the world you just watch and then he pulls out the parchment but the words have already faded at this point and he's just like oh no <laughs> and that's why it's so funny it's so contrived for no reason like it was literally just happenstance. It's not like Shona did anything to keep him from, you know, becoming the most powerful man in the world. He just, out of his own hubris, didn't look at the paper in time, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> I actually love the idea of just some guy from Scotland being the most powerful <laughs> guy in the world. <laughs> According to the, like, author bio on the Creepers website, Edgar J. Hyde is Scottish, so I think this was just him having fun with the idea of, like, Scotland and Scottish history and mythology and whatnot. Um, so that I can, I can get behind. I love Scottish mythology. I love Celtic anything, honestly. Um, I'm also very Scottish, so maybe I'm Edgar J. Hyde. This book is where I really noticed that chapters would start and end in random places. There was no, like, rhyme or reason that a chapter would start. Sometimes it would be even in the middle of a scene that a chapter break would happen. They have page breaks where they have little icons to, like, do a page break but even those didn't have a lot to do like a lot of times it would be a time skip to have a page break but why wouldn't you do a chapter break then i personally don't know really the rules and regulations on chapter breaks versus page breaks but this one really felt like there was no reason for there like it was just random just oh we need a chapter break here but it's like we're in the middle of a scene. This book is also the only one that has this like framing device of the grandmother is actually telling the story and at the very end she's like, thanks Mr. Hyde for letting me share my story. It's weird. This book also had a very bad case of like long speeches and info dumping. I mean all of them kind of info dump but this one was like every other page there was a long speech and an info dump and there's like three or four scenes where it's just people explaining things to Shona. I think it's more because this was kind of high concept. This isn't simply a ghost story. And finally we have Stage Fright. This one is the best of the four or rather the least worst. Nothing much to the story. These girls are playing witches in a play and the play is cursed. They're actually saying spells and the witches that the play is based off of like make a deal with the girls playing witches and whatnot. It has like a sordid history of everyone in the play getting hurt or you know, you know mistakes happening or something like that. So the witches will like sweeten the deal of like you want to be, they'll, I guess, manipulate the, the girls into joining with them by granting their wishes, and so things, like, happy things happen, they start getting, like, 
A's on tests, the boys that they like start giving them attention, things like that. But the girls actually realize that they're doing bad things when they wish harm on a young bully kid and uh, he actually gets really hurt. And so then they're like, oh my god, this is like actually awful. And so when the witches try and make a deal with the actresses, they're like, we can't let the witches win. And so in order to fight off the witches, they change the words of the play. And that's the story. Again, there was head hopping. There were characters that were just talked about but not given an introduction. There's weird chapter breaks and page breaks and whatnot. But this one, you know, felt a little bit more thought out. It actually felt like there was a through line with the story and the girls actually had to do something to get the witches to not take over or win, basically, um, rather than just things happening the chips falling where they may, um, like in the other books. This one also had the scariest imagery, which I thought was nice um, compared to the other ones. Not that it was like horrifying or actually scary. That is along the lines of like, you know, a, a, a Goosebumps book. All right, this video was really negative. I was just dogging on these books for a really long time. So I'm gonna give some positives. There were some interesting ideas. Some ideas that I really liked were the ideas of the sympathetic main character being a descendant of the murderer rather than a murder victim. That was really interesting. I wanna see that played out more. I like the idea of witnessing the murder happen in your dreams as if you were the murder victim. I thought that was interesting. I've definitely, I feel like I've seen that uh, somewhere else like depicted very well. I don't know what I'm thinking of, but I've definitely seen something like that and it can be done very, very well. This is not done very, very well. I like the idea in Golden Goblet, the ghosts are helping. So she has like all of these Scottish ancestors and as she's going on her mission, the ghosts are like helping her not be suspicious and are like giving her information and encouraging her along the way. And I really like that. I think that's really cool. I would love to see ideas like that expanded on because there there's like a grain of something interesting there. Right now it feels like these books are in the shitty first draft stage. If you've ever read Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, which is her like book on like writing tips and whatnot, she has this idea of the shitty first draft stage where you just word vomit. You get everything out on the page, all of your ideas because you need to actually see it on the page to then start thinking about it. You need to just get your ideas out of your head to make room for the better ideas. And while you're writing your shitty first draft, you need to be aware that it's gonna be shitty and that's okay because it's not the final draft. I just realized there's a whole mic stand behind me. <laughs> if you wondered what that was, it's a mic stand. My boyfriend does um, music production. <laughs> And this book feels like it's in the shitty first draft stage. There are characters entering that have not been introduced. There are deus ex machinas. There's contradicting dialogue and actions. There are things that don't fully connect, but the idea is there. The interesting concept is there. So we just need to like do a couple more rough drafts before we get to a better version. If we just done a couple more revisions, these books wouldn't be as bad and I'd just be like oh this is kind of a weird kids book and it didn't entertain me as an adult but it definitely would a kid but right now it's like these books are awful they are badly written badly structured and the dialogue is stupid and it's not, <laughs> it's not even good enough for a kid to read that was kind of harsh sorry all right the other positive I have is the artwork is like really cool it has some really cool artwork that's from stage fright like that a skeleton in a kilt. I love that. Look, he's got like a long sword. That's cool. That's really cool, actually. That tattooed on me. This one's really, really cool. These are both from Golden Goblet with the like stained glass window. And I don't know if you can see, but it's like zombie people. That's like really fucking cool. Here's another really cool piece. Oh, this one's not bad little ghost picture of a little ghost girl. So cool. So the artwork's really cool. Let me see if it says who the art was. Illustrations by Chloe Tyler. So Chloe Tyler did a really good job on the artwork. I thought that was really cool. So in conclusion, these seem to be a knockoff of Goosebumps. Goosebumps doesn't hold a monopoly on scary stories for kids. Like you got something scary, scary stories to tell in the dark, things like that. But I mean, Creepers with the, the fonts. Kind of feels like a Goosebumps knockoff. 
Edgar J. Hyde, R.L. Stein, feels feels knockoffy. And that in combination with the fact that the writing is lazy, the writing was lazy, there's like no moral to the story, so it's not even like a good kid's book, it's just like some ideas thrown at the wall. It doesn't feel like there was a lot of effort put into this book. So all in all, I definitely do regret <laughs> spending $1.25 on these books. I would not pay over 50 cents for these. I mean, they're tiny, they're not good books. Let's see, one, two, this is $5 worth of books. This is because it's $1.25 each. I'm not even including tax, but this is $5 worth of books for the four of them. And so I spent $5 on some shitty books. <laughs> I don't think these books are worth a dollar. Um, if you see these in your local Dollar Tree, I wouldn't get them, but maybe if your kid is interested in them, let your kid buy them. That was my, <laughs> that was my rant review of some books that I definitely shouldn't have thought about so hard. <laughs> I spent way too much time thinking about these books. I would read a page and go, I don't wanna finish this, but I knew I could make content on it. So that's why I did finish them. If you like the video, give it a like and subscribe. If you have any suggestions on actual scary kid book stories, put them in the comments below. Um, other than that, thank you so much for watching and bye! If he's Scottish, why didn't he just make stage fright about Macbeth?